All right. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, here you go, Mike. I'm right here, Dan, and I'm here. <laughs> oh, look, and my name. Yeah. 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 Wait a minute. Just my name. Is that? I'm gonna move down one. Tom. What's that? Here. Tom, get an extra chair. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Barbara Stratner. I'm the curator of exhibitions for the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. And I'd like to welcome you all to this exhibition-related public program. We have another public program in this series next Monday, also at 6.30 in this auditorium, which will be on horror film and contemporary performance. I'd also like to um, invite you all to take your copies of Fangoria and Scarlet Street, which are on the table outside, and which have come to us courtesy of Fangoria and Scarlet Street. That's us. Nice. <laughs> I'd also Thank like you. to remind those of you who have not seen the exhibition that it does continue in the main gallery through April 26th, and that screams on screen 100 years of horror film, which was created by the New York Public Library. Um, many of the staff members here, including Louis Paul, who is going to be the moderator of today's panel. This program is supported with public funds from the Cultural Challenge Initiative, a joint program of the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Screams on Screen, 100 Years of Horror Film was made possible in part by New Line Cinema and New Line Television. The New York Public Library for the Performing Arts thanks Chivas Regal for its generous contribution to our 1994, 1995 series of public programs. And the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts acknowledges the leadership support of Lewis and Dorothy P. Um, introducing in the panel today is our moderator, Louis Paul, who is the publisher of Blood Times and a member of the public service staff of the New York Public Library. I'm gonna get settled here. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank the library's exhibitions curator, Barbara Stratner, for inviting me to assist her and the uh, staff that put this horror film exhibition together. Uh, Tom Masante, Richard Rines, Brian Ross and Mary Ellen Rogan. And all together, these people worked really hard to put this exhibit together, and I'd like to thank them. we also like to thank the Division uh, of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, uh, especially the Billy Rose Theater Collection, for allowing us to use the materials in the exhibit. Uh, we worked really hard putting this together, and um, the theater collection uh, had a great amount of materials that no one seem to have even known, including the theater collection that they had, so we really wish to thank them for their cooperation. Tonight, we have an esteemed panel of authors, editors, publishers, who specialize in writing about the genre. Ken Johnson. It is hoped that tonight's forum will be informative, educational, and fun. I think it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like that to start shit tonight's here. discussion by introducing the panelists. And then, begin with questions to the panelists. And if time allows, and I'm sure it will, I would like, also like to take questions for the panel from the audience, for those of you who wish to ask them questions. Okay. Since everybody regrouped, <laughs> <laughs> we figured out this whole thing. Everybody hold up uh, your To my left, I have uh, Tom Johnson. He's co-author of Peter Cushing. A Gentleman of Horror in his 91 films, as well as a, another work to be released, uh, Hammer Films Productions Limited. He's co-authored with Deborah Del Vecchio, fourth person down. They both collaborate on these books. Next is Tom Weaver, who has authored many volumes, co-author and sole author of 
books about interviews with authors, B films, science fiction films, horror films. Uh, he's worked on many projects. He is currently working on the films of John Carradine. Next is Jessie Lilly. She's the publisher of Scarlet Street, the magazine of mystery and horror. Uh, Richard Valley at the end is the uh, editor in chief. of Scarlet Street. In chief. We have Deborah Delbalchio, who I've mentioned, his co-author. David Scal is next. Mr. Scal is the author of several works about the horror film genre. His most notable recent work is The Munster Show. Next is Monster. 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 <laughs> Being corrected by the audience. We're having fun tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of fun. Right. Next is Maitland McDonough. Uh, she's worked, uh, written many uh, articles covering the European genre horror films, and she's authored a book on Dario Argento, Broken Mirrors, Broken Minds. Beautiful. And she has uh, a book coming out on B film genre <laughs> directors. And another volume coming out on the 50 most best erotic horror films. Not no. horror films. Best Just erotic. erotic the 50 no. most erotic films of all time for a little change of pace. <laughs> but that's not to say it will be entirely not like the things I've done in the past, I promise. <laughs> I mean, hey, when dinosaurs rolled the earth, we'll be in there, so. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Think on Next that. Yeah, Anthony Timponi. And Anthony Timponi is the uh, Anthony editor of Fangoria magazine, okay. who uh, have nicely provided us with some of the slides that were available that you saw during the presentation before we came out. Next to him is Michael Shingle. He's also an editor of Fangoria. <laughs> and a former publisher of Scarabinalia. He's a contributor to the Motion Picture... Motion Picture Guide, yeah. Motion Picture Guide. Then we have Richard Valley. The mention is Scarlet Street. Now that was comical. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many people out here tonight. All right, with the ship is. All of tonight's <laughs> panelists have written for various publications, and some have even appeared on television. And radio talk shows to discuss the horror film genre. Tonight is an important occasion, for this is the first time in the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts that so many people from divergent backgrounds and personal interests within the genre will gather to speak and interact about the film art form that we are celebrating with the exhi exhibition that's upstairs. So uh, I hope everyone has a nice time. Enjoy the panel, and uh, everyone is welcome to stay for the small reception that follows the panel discussion. Here is the first question of the evening. Uh oh. To the panel. <laughs> Get ready. What, in your opinion, is the classic horror film? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> Tom. Uh, I I would think. Um, <laughs> this is one that most of us, I think, will come up with the same answer, I hope, because if they don't, then I just bad know, chance myself. But I think it's hard to say anything other than the 1931 Frankenstein, um, even though it copied ideas from previous films, it still made most of the rules that the future horror films would follow. Uh, it established uh, its director, James Whale, and its star, Boris Karloff, and uh, I don't think you can really say any other movie had as much effect on horror films as Frankenstein. <clears throat> I also don't think there's any movie of that vintage, of that type, that has better performances than Frankenstein, especially when you compare it to movies like Dracula and things like that that were coming out of, and King Kong even, that were coming out at the Excuse same me, time. Excuse me, are the mics picking up? People seem to be having... Speak to the microphones, please, because we can't hear All right. Sure. I really think the performances in Frankenstein are excellent. And <laughs> Sorry, it's a lot. <coughs> Speak up, Tom. I think the performances in Frankenstein are excellent by Bacon. <laughs> Even by today's standards, and particularly when you compare them to movies like Dracula and King Kong and a lot of the other horror classics of the day. And I don't think anybody ever was better than Boris Karloff as the monster or Colin Clive as Dr. Frankenstein, including the new movie. 
Are we going, well, if we're going down the line, Debbie, why don't you just say why your face got so angry when someone said universal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like anything, look. Um, horror films are subjective. So someone may say, well, this is a classic horror film, but someone else would say, well, I don't agree with that. I think this film is the greatest horror film ever made. So I, I think I like any art. It's subjective. So I don't know, maybe the classic horror film hasn't been made yet. Maybe it has. It's up to you. Well, I'm surprised nobody mentioned uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is the the uh, the kind of horror text you know, of, of, of the whole genre. Uh, certainly, most of the horror classics of the 20s and 30s drew inspiration, characterizations, uh, uh, and, and, and visuals, especially from from this film. You can see glimmers of Dracula, Frankenstein, even films like King Kong in uh, the cabinet of Caligari. And uh, it kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, it drew upon the visual arts and theater, but in terms of cinema, it was absolutely original. And it's continuing, uh, I think, to have an effect today. Uh, when you, most recently, uh, Brandon Lee in The Crow is a figure that is drawn directly from that, that image of Conrad Veidt in in Caligari. I always thought it was a shame that uh, Byte didn't get to play Dracula. He was considered for the part uh, for a bit in the late 20s because uh, he, he really inspired so much of the, what's come out of the genre. But uh, you have your own. Oh, and I'd say that at the same time, of course, you can't neglect to mention Nosferatu, a film that took many of the, the visual motifs of German expressionism, which you see very clearly in Caligari, and integrated them with a more realist style of filmmaking. Uh, Nosferatu is clearly a film that, without which, the universal horror films could never have looked the way they did. So I think what we're beginning to come to here is, is the conclusion that you really can't name the classic horror film, even if, yeah, exactly, as you said, <laughs> one person back. Not only is it subjective, but even if you narrow it to a particular historical period, the so-called golden age of horror, which most people would say is, is the age of the universal horror film of the 30s and early 40s, even there, there's no one film that sums up everything that you would want to say about the genre. There are a number of films, and you really need to consider them all. And I'll leave poor Tony now to pick up from there. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to come up with a splatter time. Right. Well, Halloween. that's why he's here. I, I don't think I could pick one class. Well, actually, I could pick one favorite horror film. I would just go with Psycho in terms of sheer technical brilliance. That's my all-time favorite horror film. And I also think it's probably the classic horror film, even though it doesn't have the traditional monster figures in it. it just replace the supernatural with the guy next door. I think in terms of uh, recent horror trends, the uh, quote classic that started it was probably Halloween in 1978 because uh, that only not only established a new series of conventions for modern horror and also for thrillers which don't necessarily fall in the horror genre but uh, for a long time changed uh, the uh, financial um, qualities of horror films. That started a trend of very low budget films achieving a lot of uh, popularity and uh, inspired a lot of people to make uh, low budget horror films with hopes to get uh, into the mass market um, and pave the way for a lot of future successes. Very few of them of the same quality, but uh, certainly in terms of influence, I'd say that's a sort of a modern classic. Yes. I love being down at the end of the table here because I feel sort of like the pin in a bowling alley. All the answers come barreling down towards me. We've had a number of people say that there's no way we can really pick uh, a classic horror film, and then it's left to us at the end to actually see whether we can come up with one. Uh, you I notice kind of I agree didn't say anything. It, it, it comes down to uh, it really comes down to a favorite film uh, more than a classic film. There are any number of classic horror films. If I had to choose a favorite. I would go, uh, well, it would have to be two favorites, actually. It would have to be Bride of Frankenstein. Um, Frankenstein is certainly wonderful, but I, we're talking here about a classic horror film, not necessarily one that was the most innovative, that uh, set all the, everything that was to follow. And uh, many people, myself included, prefer Bride over the original Frankenstein. Now, a little later down the line, I think another film that is uh, absolutely classic as far as I'm concerned is uh, Hammer's Brides of Dracula. 
which I think is uh, one of the best horror films ever made. Let's hear it for Hammer. We just okay. got a lot of interesting comments on that one. Um, this next question, the answers can come starting with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with their big budgets and all-star casts, do you think that the recent success of genre films such as Bram Stoker's Dracula, Wolf, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, an interview with the vampire, are any indication that the horror film has finally arrived in terms of legitimacy? Um, well, to begin with, I don't think it arrived with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein because that wasn't much of a hit. Um, Bram Stoker's Dracula certainly wasn't. The others certainly were to, to various extent. Um, I don't know that it's a matter of uh, them ha having arrived. It's simply a matter of what's going to make money for Hollywood, and Bram Stoker's Dracula made money. They saw that it would be possible to make horror films uh, with a larger budget, with all-star casts, that it, uh, they could do it and bring in some cash. And as long as they continue to do that, then the, the horror film will have arrived as far as big budgets are concerned. But the minute uh, you have one flop after another, uh, then they'll disappear again, just like disaster films disappear, just like uh, roadshow musicals disappear. I think also there's a certain reluctance in terms of people in Hollywood to call these movies horror films. Uh, one thing that I've found a lot uh, through working at Fangoria is when you're talking about something like, um, well, for example, Wolf and uh, even Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, you have the filmmakers saying, well, these aren't really horror films, but... Uh, uh, I guess, you know, when you have Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson and Robert De Niro starring in these films, it does lend the genre a certain sense of legitimacy, and uh, it shows that we're starting to come out of this sort of, uh, this bad image that horror films got in the early 80s with all the mad slasher films that were coming out. I think now people are seeing that uh, you can return to the old style of horror films. All of the big successes are sort of returns to the, the style or the subject matter, at least, of the universal films. and. Um, it's, it's encouraging to see that, and I hope it keeps up. Yeah, I think um, horror definitely is getting a new legitimacy. You know, as Michael said, now that the fact that you know, all the top tomatoes in Hollywood are, are making these kinds of pictures, and also they're being treated more seriously by uh, the critical community as well, um, because I think even in the 30s and 40s, those films were treated as kids' films by the critics of the day. They didn't have the same kind of weight as you know, the gone with the winds and those kind of pictures. They were, you know, they were treated condescendingly and that, and that followed right up until, uh, I think, the modern days. You know, uh, the, even the, the Hammer stuff, I think, was treated as kid stuff by the, the serious critics at, at the time and not really reviewed respectfully. So I think uh, now that the, the Coppolas and the Branas are reinventing the Gothic or re-exploring it has been a real boost to the critical standing horror films today. That said, though, I think we're also seeing films being made by major studios, not so much because the studios believe in the horror genre as because individual filmmakers who at a particular time in a particular place had the clout to get those films made, pushed them through. I cannot believe that Bram Stoker's Dracula would ever have been made had it been not for the fact that Francis Ford Coppola wanted very badly to make it, Winona Ryder wanted very badly to be in it. And that combination gave it the clout it needed to push it through. I mean, I think you guys probably remember that before that film was released, everybody was convinced that it was going to tank big time. I mean, they were calling it Howard the Bat. Everybody thought it was going to be a disaster. And then, within a month, it was a huge hit. And nobody would fess up to having called that film Howard the Bat. Everybody always knew it would be a hit. Coppola, Ryder, you know, Gary Oldman, how could it not be? So I think more than anything, we're just seeing a, a cyclical Hollywood pattern. One film has done very well because one visionary filmmaker who wanted to get it made got it made, and uh, Hollywood is jumping on the bandwagon, making more films that it hopes will be just like that and will be big hits just like it. And already we've seen Frankenstein, a film that was not a big success and was not, I think, an artistic success either. So I think we're looking at a cycle that's repeated itself since the beginning and, and will keep on doing so. You see, David doesn't like this one anymore. Hi, Go ahead. Go ahead. 
ACDC. <laughs> uh, I'm, well, I'm not. The, the question kind of uh, assumes that uh, horror ought to be legitimate, and I, I think it's important to to think about the fact that horror movies draw a lot of their energy and their appeal in that they occupy dangerous territory, transgressive territory. Uh, they don't happen in the daylight. They're not about anything in our mainstream kind of lives. So do we want to mainstream horror films? Uh, budgets often sink things big time. I mean, uh, you can argue about Bram Stoker's Dracula, but certainly Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and uh, uh, Wolf were uh, uh, box office disasters. Uh, I, I think that uh, for horror to work, it requires a, a real single focus kind of directorial control. Hitchcock certainly had that with Psycho, which was a very low budget film. Um, but in the big studio system, the bigger the films get, the more budgets, the less control directors have. And I think that's why we don't see uh, really masterful horror movies uh, coming down the pike that often, at least not, not from the majors. Uh, certainly a lot of good independent filmmakers, uh, but uh, horror movies tend to still be a place that many filmmakers get their start and do a really good job at them and then go off and make money and do other very boring kinds of things, but, uh, but I, 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 think, uh, I don't think horror should stay in the gutter, but I'm not sure we want it in our living rooms, but I don't know if that answers the question. Deborah, you well, I don't know how much I could add to that, but... Um, I think Silence of the Lambs did a lot for the horror film, even though it wasn't a horror film. Uh, <laughs> by winning Best Picture, I thought I'd never live to see it. A horror film winning a Best Picture. It just astounded me. I said, well, it can only get better. And I can remember, um, well, of course, my, my, my favorite, my love, my Hammer films, how <laughs> they affected the industry, how they forced the industry to sit up and take notice. Um, force them to increase budgets, force them to shoot films in color. I mean, they were, they had films in the can that they were, you know, penciling in in color just to get a color shot somewhere in the film because of the success of Curse of Frankenstein and later Horror Dracula. And I think that was a pivotal point. And then Silence of the Lambs came along, won Best Picture, and elevated the genre even more. And I think that's why, and then too, you have a lot of people that um, are our age, you know, the baby boomers who grew up with these films and loved these films and wanted to give them a little more respect than they had had in the past. And I think now they're in positions where they can make the moves, where they can make the, you know, the, uh, they have the, the clout. And um, I think you're going to see a, a big difference. Uh, you'll never be able to go back to the B-budget film. Um, I don't think we'll ever see that other than direct to video. I think whatever's going to come out in the theaters now is going to have a, a good sized budget and whether it's good or bad, I don't know. It can only, it depends on the filmmaker. The filmmaker can make a good movie or a bad movie. You know, but uh, if the budget's there, you can make a halfway decent one. We all benefit from it. Oh joy, I've got the <laughs> mic. And I have absolutely nothing to say. It's already all been said and then I get to listen to Tom say it again. There's uh, <laughs> well, we'll just say something about Universal. So don't I'm not going to say a word about Universal. Universal doesn't come into this discussion um, at the moment. <laughs> Wait until question 13. Uh, we, the, what David said earlier, and Maitland as well, about how many of the um, directors today and the people doing the horror films today got their start in horror films in the first place, like Coppola. He worked with Roger Corman. Jack Nicholson worked with... Roger, Roger Corman. Corman. <laughs> a lot of Roger Corman stuff coming up here. I think the thing that worries me is, yes, I think the big budgets do lend a certain amount of legitimacy to it, and certainly the Oscars, all of these good things that are happening, it's certainly good for business on our end. There's no question about that. But I'm afraid that the more money they get, the worse job they do. Um, I, I was not real pleased with Dracula, although it was a successful, uh, successful at the box office. Um, Frankenstein was a bomb, uh, and Wolf was a bomb, but they're going to video, and they're going to make a fortune in video because people are going to go buy the horror films. I would much rather see, aside from the, the one or two really wonderful pieces, like Interview with the Vampire, which I loved, uh, 
Silence of the Lambs, which I also loved. These are stellar <coughs> standout. You'd, they come along once in what, every 20 years or so? But you keep giving them lots of money like they did with Dracula and, and you can forget it because they just, they get carried away. They lose control and it isn't any good. So although you have a certain legitimacy added now, you're also losing quality, I think. A horror film was meant to be made in a back alley <laughs> with very little money. They're just much better that way. What? Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt you. Don't no, that's me. quite all right. Another thing that I, I noticed too is um, it's the audience demand for something different. They want to see something different. Again, not to harp on Hammer films, but <laughs> <laughs> Hammer films <Not> gave you. <laughs> Hammer films gave audiences what they were looking for: more visual horror, which had only Sex been suggested in the Universal <laughs> films. Now audiences demand even more. So I mean, it's going to mean larger budgets for better special effects. And I don't know, you know, you you know, you want to be shown things. Yeah, but what would you rather watch personally? Just out of curiosity, what would you rather watch? Would you rather watch a Freddy Krueger? I or would you rather watch, watch a I'd Peter like Cushing? I like to watch any any of them because really? I'm not pigeonholed. I like okay. good films and I don't like bad films. Then I can't. But I don't care who made it or what the budget was. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. Yeah. Doesn't matter to me. <coughs> okay. See, I'm not. You're up. I'm, I'm not up. a Tom Weaver. Exactly. Here we go. If horror ever arrived and hit a, and uh, maintained any sort of feeling legitimacy, it was in the early 30s, when before any sort of prejudices took root, before it was possible to say, oh, it's just another horror movie, because there was no established genre at that point, and you can't say, oh, it's another Dracula movie when it's the first Dracula movie <laughs> or anything like that, and also. Uh, Frankenstein uh, was seen by 15 million people when it came out, which if it came out today in 15 million people, just in America, which if it came out today in 15 million people saw a movie, it would make $100 million, well over $100 million right there. So Frankenstein and other movies like it were a huge hit. And for all this talk of Silence of the Lambs, I think we should mention that the first horror Oscar was Frederick March in 1931 for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. No, it, was, it wasn't the best picture, though. No, it was well, Best Actor. Silence of the Lambs was the best, best picture. Best yeah, actor. that was Best, best actor. actor. Well, I didn't say it was the first Oscar. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> as, Particular. As far as uh, horror movies being legitimate, I think they've always been legitimate with the fans. And ultimately, I think people like us sitting here in the panel and in the audience, we're the only people that really count if they're legitimate or not. There's been horror movies made ever since there have been movies because people want to see them. Mm -hmm. That's what makes them legitimate. Um, there's all this talk of... Uh, the big budgets uh, that we discussed through nine people and their answers, <laughs> and legitimacy that has started pos possibly as early as the, the early horror films of Universal, legitimacy that may have started with the Hammer films. But do you think today <laughs> legitimacy is different where yes, special effects bring a role into that? Oof. For example, like. How do you feel about the use of special effects in today's contemporary horror films? Do you feel it adds to or detracts from the film? Do you think the story gets lost? Do you think that there's a danger of, as things go on, that effects will be the horror film? Tom. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you what? say no and you're a dead man. <laughs> I think the special effects can hurt a picture in that I recently, it's not a horror movie, but I recently saw a drop zone with Wesley Snipes and special effects have come so far that even when you see a guy jump out of a plane like Wesley Snipes and fall, special effects have come so far that I don't even have any confidence that anybody really jumped out of a plane, that anybody even went up in the air. Special effects have come so far that I don't get any real sense of excitement out of a movie that I know is full of special effects because I have no confidence that any stunts are being done, that anybody's leaving a sound stage. And instead of becoming less spectacular, I sit there with the kind of a, like attitude of watching a Roadrunner cartoon. I like the Roadrunner. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I love the Roadrunner. You may keep holding that if you'd like, or I'll hold it. It doesn't matter. I really haven't got a whole heck of a lot to say where this is concerned. I said so already. I think the budgets are too big, and I think you're losing the... the you, you, what the excitement? That's what you said. Mm -hmm. The uh, willing suspension of disbelief uh, is is all fine and good, but I'm afraid they pushed me a little too.